it's, it, it, I guess the essence of it is put this way, it's more of a, it, it provides more of a psychological than a really true deep financial uh, protection or firewall for the banking system. Individual banks who are in the FDIC system, which is virtually all of them, pay a very modest insurance premium into this federal pool to create the fund of money that will back up banks in case of a panic uh, or runs on the bank. Uh, the pool is actually very small. If, if uh, it really got hit very hard, it would exhaust itself probably in a matter of days. But the very idea that such an insurance pool is there reduces the psychology of panic and fear in times of volatility and instability. So people do not go to the bank to withdraw their money in the way they used to do when there was no such backstop. So it's as much a psychological reform as anything else. So, and that is one factor that enormously stabilized the banking system after 1933-34. Uh, a second thing that the so-called Glass-Steagall Act did, uh, again 1933, uh, is it separated investment banking from commercial banking. Now, again, this is a kind of a technical matter. And that feature of the Glass-Steagall Act was repealed in the Clinton administration. Many people think its repeal is among the major reasons why the investment system got so volatile and eventually imploded or virtually imploded in 2008 and 2009. But again, for three generations or so, from the 30s down to the very early part of this century, uh, investment banking was a kind of boring and bland business in which uh, volatility was a hugely reduced because your deposits in your neighborhood commercial bank were not easily available to investment bankers making big bets on whether Facebook or Apple or whatever was going to be the next big uh, winner. Uh, when, when that firewall was taken down uh, in the late 1990s, uh, average depositors' money in commercial banks became available to the investment banking systems. In fact, investment banks started to acquire commercial banking operations just to get access to those monies, and then everybody is at risk, not just sophisticated investors. New Deal stopped that for roughly, what, 70 some years between the 1930s and the very end of the 20th century. And again, it produced a remarkable period of stability in investment banking. So what do we see here? Um, we see the New Deal intervening in the investment markets and in the banking system in the 1930s. In both those sectors, inducing a lot of stability reducing risk, making banking operations and securities stock trading more secure, and thereby including more people in the set of people that own stock, and making the banking system a much less rickety and um, explosive kind of institution in the way that it had been before. The, the, the common note here, and I'm going to use this word many times to, here in the next few minutes, is security, risk reduction, stability predictability, making these major institutions less volatile than they have been historically. All right, let me take another um, example, which uh, is a, something that touches on one of the most fundamental uh, features of our economic and indeed personal lives. Um, and we don't, I think, appreciate how much of it has to do with national policy, federal policy, and I'm talking about housing. Uh, and this is a, again, it's come back into the, into the foreground with the uh, uh, subprime crisis uh, recently. But I'm talking here about the period from the New Deal down to the opening years of this century, three quarters, the last three quarters or so, or two thirds of the 20th century, when this country lived in a context of housing policy that produced enormous changes in the way we live as people and what we look like as a society. So let me, again, and I'm talking here especially about the coming online of institutions like the Federal Housing Authority, FHA. How many people in this room have ever bought a house with an FHA loan? Some of you know what I'm talking about. Or a VA loan, if any veterans are looking Same, Essentially the same thing, slightly better terms, okay. Well, let's just re review what, what housing looked like in our society uh, before the 1930s. First of all, we were a nation of renters. Uh, again, this flies in the face of a lot of folklore about who we were as a society. But in fact, on the eve of the Depression, late 1920s, only about 40% of Americans owned their own homes. 60% were renters. 
Today it's about 65, 6, 7, 8 percent homeowners and the remainder renters. So we've reversed that ratio rather dramatically. And in fact, most of that reversal happened by 1960. We were a 60 percent homeownership society by 1960. We've nudged it up a bit, especially in the last years of the subprime uh, giddiness. It went up uh, even higher, all touched 70 percent. But we've changed the way we live. Uh, in the last half of the 20th century, and it has to do largely with policies that came down from the New Deal era. Uh, so let's just look at what things looked like before uh, the 1930s. Uh, before um, there was uh, FHA and so on in place, if you wanted to buy a home, probably talking about your grandparents here, let's say, people who were looking to buy a home in the 1920s, if you wanted to buy a home, you either paid full cash or you made what was typically a 50% down payment. When the FHA came into being in 1934. It made possible home ownership with a 7% down payment. And that's a huge difference from 50% to 7% down payment. Uh, and what was more, if you took out a mortgage for the remaining 50% of your home price, 1920s let's say, typically that mortgage would run for five to seven years at the most, and then you'd have this big so-called balloon payment you had to pay uh, at the end of that very, very short uh, period. Uh, the FHA uh, instituted and induced banks and loan agencies around the country to adopt uh, the 30-year fixed fully amortized mortgage, so you paid a level amount month by month or quarter by quarter for 30 years, at which time you would fully paid off interest and principal on the loan, you owned the house free and clear. The 30-year mortgage became the standard, the fully amortized level payment 30-year mortgage became the standard home ownership, home purchase vehicle uh, from the 1930s through the 1980s or 90s. Thirdly, the, because the FHA was a federal agency, a national agency, uh, and it wanted to make it possible for homeowners all over the country to access its uh, programs, it induced standardized appraisal practices. So that if you were a bank in Massachusetts, let's say, and you were approached to provide money for the construction of a housing project in, let's say, Mississippi, uh, in the 1920s, you probably would have said, hell no, because uh, I'm a banker up here in Boston. I don't know what they're doing down there in Mississippi. Yeah. And I don't trust their appraisal methods and never heard of some of these tactics that they're using and so on and so forth. The FHA brought into being standardized appraisal practices and standards uh, and made it possible for a lending institution in the Northeast, let's say, more or less safely to put its money to work somewhere else in the country if it had surplus capital on its books. Uh, and it's that, f that flow of money after World War II that built the Sun Belt and built suburbia. Uh, that money was most, mostly locked up in areas, uh, regions of capital surplus, which meant essentially the Northeast, until these standardized appraisal practices and institutions like the FHA came into being. So I dare say that people, I in California, many of you living in the South, are living in circumstances that were enabled by this legislation of the 1930s and the coming into being of these institutions. They're so abstract and kind of in the background in our lives that we don't really pay attention to them. But they revolutionized the way Americans live and where Americans live. Uh, the center of population gravity in our society has moved from 1940 when it was on the eastern, pardon me, the westernmost boundary of Indiana to now southwestern Missouri and will probably be in Texas by 2050. We've become a majority south, southern and western society. We're on our way to becoming a majority southern and western society, which simply wouldn't have happened without the growth of suburbia and the Sun Belt. And again, one of the great facilitating factors there are these housing policies that were put in place in the 1930s. Okay, um, let me take one last example. This one's even more, oh, well, let me, let me say one last thing about housing. Uh, and I'll, I'll make this remark or this observation in the context of the accusation, which we touched on earlier in this hour, that one frequently hears, that they heard, has heard, that the New Deal was the first step on the road to socialism. Uh, Barack Obama, this view, is the inheritor of this great socialist trend uh, in American society. <clears throat> The best working definition of socialism is that the socialist state or society is a 
place where there is public or government ownership of the means of production. Right. With the single exception, I'd say, of the Tennessee Valley Authority, there is no such thing in the United States, other than maybe the level of municipal power companies or water companies. But we did not do, we decidedly did not do in our society what happened in most Western societies in the mid 20th century. We didn't nationalize the automobile industry or the telecommunications industry or the airline industry or the steel industry, which happened all over the place, in Germany, France, Britain, Italy, and so on. To this day, there are state-owned enterprises uh, in those societies of core industries that are thought to be essential to the economic health of the society. With the, again, with the single exception, rather unique exception of the uh, TVA, we never went near any such thing. Uh, this, this, that general statement is emphatically true when it comes to housing. Uh, John Maynard Keynes, the great uh, economist of the 30s, uh, who is the father of this idea, the economic stimulus and the downturn comes through deficit spending and so on, the, pr the specific program that Keynes urged on his own country, the United Kingdom, and other countries were willing to listen to him, the specific program was the way you should, what you should do with deficit spending is build public housing. Okay? Because the housing industry is widely geographically distributed, it uses both unskilled and semi-skilled labor, uh, so you get a lot of bang for the buck and you get a real social good out of this. You're building places for people to live, put a lot of people to work, you stimulate the economy. So public housing is the place where you should invest these deficit monies to refloat the economy and create a lasting social value in the process. The result of that is that by uh, the time Margaret Thatcher, uh, not to be confused with Meryl Streep, uh, came to power <laughs> in uh, the 1970s, uh, in England, if any of you have ever been there in that period, you probably encounter something called council housing, that's public housing. 46% of uh, British people lived in council housing up through the 1970s because Britain followed John Maynard Keynes' advice and bought, bought, built a lot of public housing. Comparable figure in France uh, up through the same period, actually not changed much today, is 37%. In the United States, despite the great publicity that places like the Cabrini Green and the so on uh, homes in Chicago get, or used to get, uh, there has never been a moment when more than 1% of Americans lived in public housing. We didn't follow Keynes' advice. We didn't build public housing. We stimulated the construction of private housing by private companies using private capital and put them in the hands of private homeowners. A very, very different approach. 1% of Americans in public housing, 46% of Britons, 37% of French. That just tells us volumes about the, I, I believe is the essence of New Deal economic policy was to find ways to work in sync with and enhance the efficiency of private capitalist system. Okay? All right, one last